Hi, my name is Joe. This is stupid PCIe tricks. Um, I have an electrical engineering education with a lot of focus on computer science and infosec. So I am a hardware guy. I do know some software stuff, but I avoid it whenever possible um, because there are much smarter people who can do a much better job of most of it than I can. Um, I spent eight years doing uh, security research, speed path debug, and tool development for CPUs. I also did hardware pen testing of CPUs, um, and I did security training for functional validators, functional hardware validators, how to extend their, their validation you know, objectives to include some security objectives as well. Um, I also teach a class, uh, uh, Software Exploitation via Hardware Exploits, uh, aka Sex via Hex. We just taught it at, Def at Black Hat a few weeks ago for the first time, and we'll be teaching it a few more times from here on out. Um, that's a picture of me. I wear sunglasses to hold my hair out of my face, and I'm securely fits. Um, and I had to include a meme, because if Joe fits, Joe sits. Um, some of you may have heard about this wonderful hot tub at tour camp. It was in the back of a pickup truck. We did not manage to fill the hot tub with water from the ocean, that we didn't have enough hose to pump it all the way. But we did have a hose running uh, into the fire pit where there was a radiator coil and a wood fire that he heated the water. It was pretty nice. Um, but that's, that's all I got for silly pictures. Um, some disclaimers, this is not academic caliber research. This is for fun. A lot of this stuff, actually pretty much all this stuff has been done before. The difference is I'm trying to show you some PCIe attacks that are really easy and really cheap. So before we can jump into that, um, how many of you know what PCIe is? How many of you know what PCI is? And it's not payment card industry standards. That's a much more broken system. Um, PCI Express is uh, an enhancement on PCI. PCI is Peripheral Connect Interface, I think. Oh, I don't even remember. Um, this is a tiny screenshot of LSPCI. LSPCI is a utility in Linux that will show you all the devices on your PCI bus. Um, PCI was pretty, uh, PCI Express is great because it just extended PCI. From a software perspective, it's exactly the same thing. We don't need to worry about any differences. Um, from a hardware perspective, it is a little different though. Um, over here, we've got an old PCI bus. Uh, PCI had a whole bunch of, uh, had 32 bits that connected all of these slots together. So it was a big bus, everything is shared. PCI Express is this big, this is a 4X slot, this is a 16X slot, this is a 1X slot, and a 4X slot, and then there's a PCI slot down there. Each of these cards has a dedicated link to the CPU. So this 1X slot doesn't share anything with this 4X slot. They each have their own Xs. Um, so we have lanes. Lanes, is a, lanes are four wires, two wires going each way. Right? So you can talk in both directions, just like Ethernet, right? Ethernet, you have wires going both ways. Um, on faster Ethernet, that's another story. But uh, you combine these and you can have up to 16, or actually up to 32 uh, sets of lanes in your link, right? Most graphics cards are 16X link PCI Express devices, which means they have 64, uh, sorry, yeah, 64 wires, which are 32, uh, RX's, which are 32, 16 pairs of RX and 16 pairs of TX, right? Um, actually, I don't, I should mention, you know, the reason why we went to this whole high-speed serial way of doing things is when you have 32 wires, they all have to be the same and the same length and, you know, adjusted. You might have seen in Josh's slides this morning, he showed some memory buses on some systems where they do a lot of squiggling of wires to make them the same length. You don't have to worry about with the PCI Express because each individual lane carries its own clock. You know, every every individual sorry every individual link is a separate connection that are aggregated at a higher level. Um, so there's a hierarchy. Um, you have what's called a root complex in PCI Express. That's kind of like your chipset or your CPU, and you have a bunch of links that dangle off of it, right? You can have a bridge, which will bridge you know, this bus to a different bus, and this is, could be an old school PCI bus. You can also have a switch, which connects one bus to another bus to another device. And really, it's, it's a lot like USB in, in more ways than you'd, be, than you'd imagine. Um, you know, it auto-enumerates. Um, it switches, so you know, a hub, 
USB hub is like a switch. Inside, we've got basically a virtual PCI to PCI bridge, because remember, we want, from a software perspective, we want everything to be backward compatible. So we want to have a PCI Express system work fine in an operating system that only knows what PCI is. So we have a bunch of virtual bridges that connect to this internal bus. That's a bunch of virtual bridges that connect to, to more buses, right? Um, you're familiar with networks. You have all these layers. It's really very similar for PCI Express as well. You have a transaction layer, which is what you think of when you want to send stuff back and forth, when you want to read and write memory. Underneath that, you have a data link layer, which worries about packetizing things and organizing things. Down below, you have a physical layer, which deals with the electronics. It also de deals with you know, low-level CRC and other, you know, making sure we get the right bits back and forth. Um, from a software... Okay. So from a software perspective, we have what's called a configuration space, right? When we look at LSPCI, we're going into memory and we're reading this block, right? So this block, sorry, it's so small, um, is basically at bit zero, we have a vendor ID. At bit 16, we have a device ID, and so on and so forth. So if we do LSPCI dash D, which chooses a specific device, and we give it its identifiers, dash X and N, it's going to give us a dump of this table. And we see what it's going to tell us is that we have an Intel Corporation, uh, which is 8086 for a vendor ID, which we see 8086 is right there at bit zero and uh, byte one, zero and one. And it's a 24E, 244E, which is um, the device ID, which is an Intel product, which is the 82801 PCI bridge. Um, we have a revision ID, which shows up right here. Um, a class code, you know, in, in USB, we have like, a, like classes like a mass storage controller and a USB to serial adapter. So certain things can just use generic drivers. Same thing happens for PCI Express as well. We have these class codes, so all uh, disk drives can use the same driver instead of having to have a separate, you know, driver for every single manufacturer's revision of every single um, hard drive controller. So when you turn a system on, uh, you need to find all the devices on it. It's called enumeration, right? We start from the root complex, and he's going to go and do a depth first you know, walk through the entire space. So he's going to look at bus zero, which is this one, has one device, right? So bus zero, device zero. OK, next bus one is a bridge. Oh, bus two is this. Bus two has several devices on it. So bus two, device one, bus two, device two, bus two, device three. Then this is bus three right here. And there's a virtual bus, bus number four inside of here. And then bus five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and each one of them has one device on it, right? Um, the way this enumeration happens is actually that the root complex goes and it writes to every single bus device function combination and gets answers back. Um, so let's say you wanted to actually make traces on a board and connect PCIe to something. Um, there are some really step-by-step, -step, complicated, mandatory, inflexible rules that you have to follow when uh, routing PCIe signals. You have to route ad uh, pairs adjacent and equal length, right? So in a lane, you have TX and RX pairs. Each of those pairs have to be adjacent to each other, right next to each other, really close, and they have to be equal length, okay? You got that? That's it. That's pretty much it. Um, so they did a really good job of making PCIe really easy to, to build hardware for, because you know, why make something more difficult, right? We, we no longer have 32 wires in parallel that we have to get all length match. We just need to get these two wires from end to end properly. Um, there's some nice limits that are set. System board traces can be 12 inches. Add-in cards can have 3.5 inches of trace before they get to a chip. Um, and between two chips on a single board, you can go up to 15 inches. And really, if you follow these rules, your board might work. And if you don't, it might not work. It might still work, too, though. Um, so there's a lot of fun things we can do if we stretch these rules. Um, PCI Express, actually, uh, the spec defines external cabling, but it's all really expensive. Um, and I don't really like expensive things, because I break most of the stuff I have anyway. Um, but when we think about it, what do we have is PCI Express your TX pair is 2.5 gigahertz at PCI, X1, PCI Express 1.0, and then 2.0 added 5 gigahertz, and then 3.0 adds 8 gigahertz, and so on and so forth. And who knows where it'll go from now. 
uh, 2.5 gigahertz pair for RX and a 100 megahertz clock. And that 100 megahertz clock is actually optional, but it's really helpful to have it. And that's a reference clock. It doesn't mean that we have to be synchronous to this. This is just giving our device a reference clock so it doesn't have to provide its own. So if we look around and try and find a cheap cable that'll hold that, this is a cross-section of a USB 3 cable, right? If you've ever cut open a USB cable, a normal one, you have four wires. There's red and black, which is power and ground, and then there's a twisted pair of green and white, right? And that pair is rated for about 500 megahertz, right? Because that's what USB 2.0 uses. USB 3.0 has these two additional pairs that are sheathed, uh, green and, uh, sorry, purple and, uh, and orange and blue and yellow. And each of those pairs are rated for five gigahertz, right? Because that's what USB 3.0 is supposed to go at. Um, which is great because, as we just mentioned, we need 2.5, 2.5, and 100, and we have 5.5 five, and 500. So if we wanted to, we could actually route PCI Express over a USB cable. So here's a little PCB I laid out. Um, basically, what we've got on the bottom is a slot, uh, sorry, an edge connector that goes into a slot. Here's a USB housing, and there's a dotted line because you cut it in half. If, you know, your board costs a certain amount under a certain square inch. So this is a two inch by two inch board, which costs whatever. And I had, I'd rather than make two boards, I just put everything on one because I'm cheap. Um, so I got 10 boards, that's all I needed. So I have five configured one way and five the other way. Um, and then, so cut this here, and we have the other end, we have a USB connector, and we have a PCI Express slot. And, you know, because I didn't want to go have carry, carry all the power over, I actually used an external power header um, and a voltage regulator to give me the voltages that I needed on this slot. Um, and there's a whole bunch of pins that you can see are not connected because they're just, they don't matter. They're not important. Um, so this is what the board looks like. Populate the one side with the header. This one actually got cut in half. This one did not. It's got the header on the other end, uh, power input, some capacitors, a regulator and the slot. You see how that end right there looks a little messy? It's because I got my soldering iron when I got it really hot and just kind of jammed it through there to cut it open because the only difference between a PCI, X, PCI 1X card and a 16X card is that it's longer and has more pins. So it's auto-negotiating, right? If you have a 16X card and you put it in an 8X slot, it'll work at 8X. If you put it in a 4X slot, it'll work at 4X. If you put it in a 16X slot, but you actually accidentally put a piece of tape over one of the lines or there was an error in the trace or something, PCI Express will auto-negotiate down to as low as 1x, you know, at whatever it needs to do. It also ne auto-negotiate the speed. So if you have a 3x card and a 3x slot, but you're like standing next to a bunch of sunspots or something, it'll probably slow down to like 2.5 gigahertz. And even at 2.5 gigahertz, it won't go slower, but it does error checking and will resend things if it doesn't go properly. So it's, it's really a well-designed spec all around. So what can we do with this? This is an Intel Galileo. It's an Ar Arduino, supposedly. Um, and on the back, it's got a mini PCI Express slot. And this is supposed to be used for a very short list of Intel-certified wireless adapters. Um, but who, who pays attention to rules like that? Right, so I built this little board, similar to the other one, for a mini PCI slot, populated it, and hooked it up. So it, you can't see it, it's on the back. Popped it on, ran a USB cable to um, this tiny little graphics card. So here's 400 megahertz, 512 megabytes of RAM. Here is like 1.2 gigahertz, uh, like 1,000 core, four gig or three gigabyte, whatever. And I had to use an external power connector because you know, this uses a couple watts, this uses a couple megawatts or something. <laughs> and when you go in on, you know, the, the Galileo actually runs a uh, trimmed down version of Linux. You do LSPCI and sure enough you see all these items, 8086, 8086, 8086, 8086, 10 DE, right? That's the vendor ID for NVIDIA, right? And you can see that I loaded a driver. Nouveau is the open source uh, NVIDIA driver that I was able to compile for this platform. Um, so here we go, we have, we have our itty bitty little Arduino hooked up to a giant PCI Express card running a full HD display, right? And actually I, I had that and it's sitting on my desk at home and I can't believe that I forgot to bring that because it, it makes for a cool demo, but I apologize. There's a picture of it. Um, 
and it too much to fiddle with all the cables and get it to actually work. So, um, you know, all that's well and good, but let's talk more about the security and attack side of things. So here's some brief history. Um, Joe Grand put this thing together about 10 years ago. It's called Tribble. It's a uh, system on chip, basically it runs Linux, it has memory, it has its own PCI slots. This is for PCI, old PCI. Um, plug it in and it reads your memory. Pretty cool, huh? Um, and actually he just got this up and running and working a little while ago for some other guys to play with it. Um, because apparently PCI attacks are the new fun thing to do, right? Um, so there was also a period in there where there's, there's inception and a whole bunch of firewire attacks. Have you heard about firewire attacks? Yeah, basically you plug a firewire, if you have a system with firewire, it's easy. If you don't, you have to attach a firewire adapter somehow. The firewire driver loads, and there's a certain profile where you can hook up a device that um, tells the firewire driver to give this device full access to lower four gigabytes of memory. Sounds pretty cool, huh? Um, but there's some limitations to that. If you just block that, or blacklist that driver or remove that driver from your system or don't load it, you know, you've, you're, you're essentially protected. Or if you just don't have any ports you can plug FireWire into. Um, you can also go and if you're one of those special people who spends lots of money on interesting hardware, um, Windows Scope makes the Capture Guard physical memory acquisition hardware a PCI Express add-on for, for a scant $7,999 you can buy this uh, Xilinx uh, FPGA board that plugs into a slot, and it says you have to load drivers. I haven't, I haven't bought one and tested it yet, um, so if you want to take a collection, we could do that, but I'm not gonna bother. Um, so it says you need to actually install drivers to put this card in your system and get your memory dump, and I don't know if, why you would bother doing that if you could just install drivers, you just do it in software, but. Um, Whatever, someone, someone needs to spend $8,000, and this is the way to do it, if you're interested. If you want another 8,000, way to spend $8,000, talk to me later. I might have a similar card that I can sell you for, for, for $7,000. Um, so some losers on the other side of the world, uh, uh, I forget their names. Uh, does anybody remember who these guys were? No. Uh, Snare and Sam Collinson, uh, they put together um, an FPGA board with a Thunderbolt uh, expansion adapter. Basically, uh, you've got a bunch of Macs and you've got a Thunderbolt port and you lace this cable all the way around, or, sorry, this is, the, this is the victim. You run it around here and plug it in there. So now we have this device plugged into this Mac and we've got programming cables hooked up to this one which is gonna go and direct the attack on this computer, right? And uh, pretty cool stuff. It's kind of a large board though, and it's an FPGA, and FPGAs are complicated, and I like easy things. Um, so I went for a tiny solution that didn't require any new hardware. This is a reference board. Um, it's a chip made by PLX Technologies. It's called the USB 3380. It's uh, designed to let you turn a USB device into a PCI Express device or a PCI Express device into a USB device, right? So if you have a USB graphics adapter, right? You could grab a PCI Express you know, graphics chip and this chip, glue them together, put them in a box and plug it into USB and write your, some special drivers. Um, but it's got some neat debug features and extra features that you can use to do fun stuff. Um, it also comes in different sizes. This is a little express card one that fits into a nice little Thunderbolt enclosure. So, you know, on the go, you can carry it. It also has an ARM core on it that you could, um, no, not an ARM core, it's a 8051 core on there. So if you're fancy and like to cross compile, you can actually write all your attack code and store it natively on there. Um, this is what it looks like inside. Basically, you have the PCI Express side and the USB side and some stuff in the middle that shuffles data back and forth. Um, what isn't shown on here, basically this chip, they took the silicon from an older chip, the 2280, uh, which was a PCI device, and they took a PCI to PCI, to PCI Express bridge, and they took the, the silicon for both of those and crammed them onto one chip. So it's kind of a, a somewhat crippled device. It doesn't support things like 64-bit uh, DMA, which is unfortunate, but whatever. Um, it's also cheap. It's, the chip itself is like $10 to $15 in quantity. 
So one of the things it has that no one ever uses, and I confirm that because I asked the, uh, the uh, field service engineer, like, what, what do we, what's the intended use for this? Like, we don't know. Um, it has this PCI out endpoint. So from USB, you can, you can look at the endpoints. The endpoints are like the input and output ports that in software that you see when you plug a USB device in. Um, and you get to basically define your PCI Express packet, right? So just spit these, you know, zero to seven or 15 or however many D words out over USB, and they magically go through and come into this device and go out over PCI Express, and you get a response. So you can, you can basically craft your own PCI Express reads, writes, and everything. Um, so in order to do that, we need to mess with the firmware. And actually, this is, this is the extent of the, the code that I put together for the hardware. This is all 14 byte, bit, yeah, bytes of the firmware that I wrote. Basically, what I needed to do is say, OK, this is a valid firmware. I'm going to have zero C bytes. And these are the addresses I want to write and the values I want to write. This big value, value up here tells me I want to, yeah, I should give you a decoder card. Basically, all I'm doing is turning on USB, right? When I plug in the card, it's a PCI Express device. It turns itself on. It trains PCI Express automatically. Then it goes and checks the firmware, and it says, oh, what do I do? Turn on USB. And that's pretty much all you need. What I did here is um, this is E414BC16. This is a vendor ID and device ID of the uh, SDXC card reader on certain models of Macs. Um, and the reason I did that is what we'll see in a few moments, because some, some, some crazy folks from down under gave me a tip on which one to use. Um, yeah, that, that's all. That's the extent of how I customized it. If you wanted to build one of these, this is part of the NSA playset. There were a dozen, half a dozen people who put together toys that resembled things out of the, uh, the NSA ant catalog for uh, DEF CON. And so this is one of them. You can go on here. There's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, this is Slot Screamer. When you put it in a box with, P with Thunderbolt, we call it uh, Halibut Dugout. Um, there's a website you can do NSA Name Generator to pick these names. Um, this is the board. This is a, another version of it. I have uh, a little mini PCI version. This is a, the, a native PCI version. This one's nicer because you can pop the, fir the firmware right off of there if you break it somehow. Um, you can buy these online. I've been pleading with them because apparently they've been selling a lot more than they used to in the past month. Um, trying to get them to actually ship them with a firmware flashed already, but right now you have to flash the firmware yourself. Um, there's GitHub, which has all the software you need to get up and running. It has uh, some flashing software, uh, the Pi USB stuff I'll show you in a second, um, Inception modified for this, and uh, Actually done. This is not all the stuff that's in the repository. This is all the, stuff, the software we used preparing. Um, so what I did is made some attack side software. So the, 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 the victim side software, there is none, right? You don't need any software. You just plug it in, and you're on the bus. You, you win, right? Um, so basically, I had to make a little uh, read and write USB, or sorry, read, read and write PCIe. Uh, function, which basically would go and pack out, pack together the packet that says, I want to do a, a DMA read, I want to do a read from this address, and this is the number of bytes I want to read. And then I have to read the response and parse it. Um, so Inception is this pretty cool tool, and it uh, lets you, it's the FireWire attack, right? You plug FireWire devices into computers, you run Inception, and it will go and read through memory and modify your login. Uh, application so that it always returns true. So any password you type in, you just fall through. Um, so I modified it to instead of using the whole layer of FireWire to do memory accesses, I just had it go straight and call my Python to do memory reads and writes, um, which is a lot quicker. Um, the way that this is right out of their, their text documentation, basically you have a, a signature that you're looking for, right? And that's the assembly code that's going to be at the very end. You've just compared your password against a hash, and yay, it passes, or no, it doesn't. Well, there's a jump instruction somewhere, and all you want to do is change that jump instruction to a different one. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry. 
Um, I caught something out of the corner of my head. Um, so we basically define a bunch of patches of where to look for and what to patch them to. Every single version of every single operating system is a little different, but you just write a script that looks for all of them. It looks like this is the, this is the structure that defines what to look for and how to fix it. So attacking via PCIe. Um, so let's take a step back and talk about what PCIe does and the different types of attacks we can do. This is a list of all the TLPs, transaction level packets, that PCI Express can generate, right? So MRD is memory read, right? We can read memory, right? We can find important values at known locations. We can take memory dumps for later analysis. So an example, we can use volatility. Uh, have you heard of volatility? It's a pretty cool tool. They just released a book, which I just got and started reading on a plane over here. It's a pretty awesome book on memory forensics. Um, so basically, you take a memory dump and you load it up in volatility, and you know basically it can give you a, you know, look at the dmessage log. You can look at names, PIDs, and UIDs of processes that are that are found in memory. There's even a feature where it gives you like a virtual console, like you can navigate around the system. So it's kind of weird. Um, and uh, we can extract machine info. Um, and in this system, you know, we have four, four gigabytes of memory. And again, we're limited to 32-bit addresses, so only four gigabytes. Um, NWR, memory write. Um, we can modify known values in location. We can manipulate code. Um, Inception uses this to modify locks, lock screen checking. Um, it'd be really cool to do this to drop a Metasploit you know, payload to you know, find the spot in memory and overwrite some code and insert your own stuff, right? It's memory. You have full access to it. There's no one telling you you can't do it. Usually. Um, so the, just a couple weeks ago, Inception had a new, new release where there was a proof of concept for Win, <coughs> excuse me, Win 7 uh, SP1 uh, proof of concept for, you know, uh, Metasploit plugin, which is pretty cool. Um, because for a long time, people have been talking about DMA attacks, but all they're doing is lock screen bypass. There's so much more fun stuff you can do, but I guess software people are like, well, if I can bypass the lock screen, I can do everything in software, and I don't need to use your hardware anymore. Go away, hardware person. Hmm. Silly software people. Um, so I.O. read and I.O. write. Um, I.O., if you ever are familiar with uh, x86 assembly, it's like the port command, uh, the in and the out commands, and you write to a port and a value. Really is not used at all anymore. New PCI Express devices are not supposed to use this, but for backward compatibility, compatibility, older devices can. So it's legacy, and legacy translates to not thoroughly tested recently. We haven't been doing security testing for a long time, so you know, recently means it probably was not tested to the same standards we do today. Um, config read and config write. Um, this is how we would act, interact with other PCI devices. If we look at that, that structure we had before that we used to figure out LSPCI output, um, that's what config read does. It goes through and parses that. Um, it's basically another separate address space that's giving us the access to that same uh, information. So you know, when you have three different ways to get to one byte, whether it's to read or to write, that's three different areas you should have some sort of protection that should be similar, right? If your protection isn't the same in all three spots, then you just figure out where the protection is weakest and attack there, right? And there's also messages. Um, they could be interrupts and vendor-defined uh, configuration messages. Um, there are lots of different types. They're not very heavily used. Um, Joanna Rutkowska um, published a paper like two months after Sandy Bridge came out with a whole bunch of Sandy Bridge VTD uh, vulnerabilities she found. And basically, she went through and she said, oh, well, I can make a PCI Express device send these uh, message signal interrupts that should not be sendable from an external device that would, you know, do something like reset a core in the middle of execution. Pardon me. So, how about mitigations? What do we have for time? That was one. <coughs> there we go. So, bus master enable. Um, devices are supposed to have this bit bus master enable that tells them whether they're allowed to be a bus master or not. This, mean, this is from like old PCI days when you had eight cards and eight slots, and they'd have to take turns to be in charge. Um, and you'd actually have to tell a card, okay, you're allowed to be in charge now. Um, and then it would be able 
do whatever we wanted to. Um, what's funny about bus master enable is a couple things. Number one, this bit is stored on the device and it's tracked by the device. And so the operating system tells the device, okay, you're allowed to be a bus master now. Keep track of that. Remember that. You know, don't, don't do bus mastering un until I told you you can do it. Um, and this is a LSPCI uh, grepping for bus master. And actually, every single device in Linux gets bus master turned on automatically all the time. Um, doesn't matter if a driver gets loaded or not. Every single device on PCI Express in Linux has bus master able turned on. I didn't check for Windows. Mac actually does not do this, which is pretty cool. Um, they actually thought about it. Um, there's also this other one called Access Control Services. I don't know for sure what is actually causing it. When I find, when I find out when I'm on my Mac, if I don't have a valid driver, I can't do DMA access, right? I'm pretty sure it's because they're using Access Control Services, but I am not software savvy enough to go and figure out from the software side if that's the case. And they haven't had enough time to do it from the hardware side. Um, access Control Services basically lets you know uh, let's all the routing layers of your PCI hierarchy know what stuff they're allowed to route. It has things like source validation, which makes sure that you know you are who you say you are in your request. Um, translation blocking, re request redirecting, a um, whole bunch of different things to make sure that things aren't sending things they're not allowed to send. Um, so it blocks things on, on a hierarchy level as opposed to from the device. And then there's an IOMMU, for example, VTD. Um, normal virtualization, you have two software virtual machines and a layer that isolates you from hardware. With an IOMMU, what you can do is you can have two software virtual ma machines and then you can have two hardware devices and you can actually directly map these hardware devices into your virtual machine. So you could have a, a system with two graphics cards and two operating systems running and each operating system has its own graphics card and the graphics card has its own operating system and no one is the wiser to anything else going on because it's all handled in these intermediate layers. Um, so um, what can we do about all this stuff? Um, so first, we, when we have our own hardware that we're defining, we can do whatever we want. We can say whatever we want, right? So we have our own vendor ID and product ID, right? It, that identifies our device to the operating system. The operating system can choose which driver to load, right? Once it does that, it configures access control services, it configures, configures bus master enable and other things, and then it loads a driver, right? So all we need to do to get a driver, to get ourselves access to the bus is just look like something that the operating system trusts, right? Don't even have to worry about the, the other layers yet. Maybe they'll fix this. Um, so default drivers. Some drivers are class drivers. Like I mentioned, USB has different classes that have generic drivers. Some Device-specific drivers might be installed by default. Mac OS has a ton of drivers for all hardware that Mac has ever, that Apple's ever shipped. Um, what's great though is drivers contain bugs. And think about it, like you, you know, you have, you've heard of the Face Dancer, right? It's a USB emulating type layer thing. Um, and you can, you can make hardware that's not really hardware and make it programmable and scriptable. Well, you can kind of almost do the same thing for PCI Express devices and, you know, the barrier entry is a lot lower for USB than it is for PCI Express, and there's been tons of stuff found in the past year, year and a half, using the Face Dancer on, on USB. So I think there's plenty of room for, for, for these kind of bugs on PCI Express as well. Uh, another uh, nice thing to know is at early boot, the IOMMU is not configured yet, right? You turn on the system, you don't have virtualization on. Um, neither is much else, right? It'd be really cool if volatility added support for FE, like an FE shell. Perhaps someone already has done that and I just didn't look hard enough, but that'd be really cool. Or the early Mac you know, preboot environment where it asks for your password to start decrypting your disk. Because at that point in time, you don't have any, I mean, you have very little code that's been loaded into memory. It's like very little, uh, what's the word for random stuff? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Entropy in the system, right? It, 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 it's a fun time to do fun things. Um, the other thing you have is um, option ROM and FE drivers. Some devices actually carry firmware that will get run on the host PC at early boot. <coughs> there are actually a few systems that block this, but the reason they do that is more for anti-competitive reasons than security. So like Dell and HP block you from putting external graphics cards into systems because they don't want you to like 
do that on the low end systems. They want you to buy a high end system and stuff like that. Or servers is what it is. They don't want you to buy a server. They want you to buy their Alienware laptop and, or uh, desktop instead. Um, but you know, you block the the, F, the option ROM, and you know you don't get your hardware to run whatever it wants at early boot before most of the security has been enabled. And then there's just plain old breaking rules. Um, there's a re requester ID. It's kind of you think of a network terms. You know, you, you send you know a packet and it tells you what your IP address is so it can send the response. Well, what if you put something else in that response? You know, you won't get the response. Something else will. Well. If you um, send a posted transaction, which is a, tra a transaction that doesn't require a response, right? If you just do a write to memory, if you know where you're trying to go and you just do a write to memory and you pretend you're someone else, will it get by? Maybe. Um, Well-timed uh, spoofed requester ID for a non-posted transaction. Let's say you know another device in the system is waiting for data. If you can do a read to another spot in memory and get the response to go there, you could do some fun stuff. Um, there's also this cool feature, uh, address translation services. It's, uh, it's for performing performance on virtualization. And I better hurry up and get moving. Um, so you can, you can set this bit that says translated request, which means you already went and requested um, a, your translated address. So you gave a virtual address. It translated for you, gave you the response. And the next time you, you go and you directly access that translated address, which lets you bypass the OMMU, right? The PCI spec says you're not supposed to ever be able to access that register, that value, except from a response, from a tra uh, request translated response. But when we have an FPGA, we don't have to worry about rules, right? Or specs or any of that stuff. Like the other PCI too, no one follows that, right? Um, so misconfigurations, um, everything is MMIO now, memory mapped IO, um, and you just need to have some memory protections. Um, but remember, we also have config and IO operations, but we don't use them all that much. Um, so what about a hypervisor, right? If you have a computer that's protecting you with VTD and you install VMware and it uses VTD, is it gonna blow away what your operating system has already uh, done or is it going to collide with it at all? Good to, to poke around and figure out. Oops, I forgot to take that off. Um, putting it all together, right? So we've got Thunderbolt. Are you familiar with Thunderbolt? Yeah? Um, basically, you plug this cable in, and it makes, makes it's, it takes, uh, carries PCI Express as well as uh, DisplayPort. Um, and there's some muxing that happens and switching, and it's all on the fly. Um, and we talked about Halibut Dugout. This is a smaller version, right? Basically, we take my little PCI Express attack device, put it inside a Thunderbolt enclosure. Right? Um, and you notice the great Scott Gadget sticker because Mike Osman, when he found out I was talking, thinking about this stuff, he's like, oh, you should work on that. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't have enough time. He's like, no, you really should work on that. Here, I'll send you some hardware. And it's like, okay, I'll work on it. So he sent me this box. Um, so sorry to previous track two speakers, right? We've got uh, this computer I'm presenting from, right? I've plugged into the, uh, the, the display port to VGA adapter, right? You guys see that? Can you see it? Yeah. And uh, that goes, oh, oh, where does this go? Uh, oh, look, look what we have up here. Uh, <laughs> so here is Halibut Dugout. Here's my little attack card. Here is the VGA cable that's going up on the screen right there. So if you say, like, oh, yeah, I'm not dumb enough to put anything in my, uh, my Thunderbolt port, well, um, do you ever present? Uh, because that's your Thunderbolt port. Um, so right now that's hooked up to here, and I'm over here on this computer, and I can, I can read the memory on that computer, which is the fun stuff. Um, so if you wanted to put one together, you basically get the Thunderbolt cable, a modular telephone jack, a housing, a ferrite bead, for just because it looks cooler with the ferrite bead, and some heat shrink tubing, right? You take it apart, thread the cable through, right? And then you have this little housing you screw together on there, and bam, you've got something that looks a lot like the Apple one. And you know, you, you see the off-brand ones, and the off-brand ones are kind of clunky. And I was like, I wanted to come up with like a Crapple logo or something that I could put on there, but I didn't get it done in time. And it, it does kind of look hokey because the bottom is not obviously genuine. But if you wanted to, you can make a pretty convincing cable. Because really, how often do you have the right cable to plug in? It's like, oh, I, I forgot my adapter. I have a Mac. Sorry. 
whatever. I just wish everything had like real ports on it. I, like this has a, a, a mini VGA. Ever heard of mini VGA? Yeah, neither have I. Um, I haven't lost the adapter yet. Um, so yeah, m m pay no attention to the, the men in the middle behind the curtain, whatever. Um, that's another slide I stole. Um, basically, they, uh, Snare and Sam found that um, basically newer systems with newer operating systems on a Mac are not, cannot be owned with current means, right? Um, because VTD is enabled and blocks you from plugging something in and doing stuff. Um, so uh, they also talked about, so maybe we should make the kit a little bit smaller. So that, hey, smaller, is that? It's, it's not as fully featured as yours. What? Well, yeah, yeah, so, that's, that's a software problem. Yeah? Um, so bypass VTD, that'd be really cool, and see if we can do it without imitating a device. So what about bypassing VTD on a MacBook? So VP, VTD is off at boot and reset, and Broadcom Ethernet drivers crash this, oh, crap. I was gonna actually do that, but in order to do that, I have to unplug the display, so I can't actually show you doing that. Sorry. Um, so basically, if I plug this in here, right, it'll try and load uh, Thunderbolt Ethernet, uh, sorry, Broadcom Ethernet driver onto this. This is not a Broadcom Ethernet device, so something will crash. Someone with some software uh, expertise would probably find something really cool in that. All I found is that it reboots the system. When it reboots the system, it comes up to the login screen. Enter your password, right? Enter your full disk encryption password. At that point in time, VTD is off. What's also convenient is that at that point in time, there are drivers for the same card. So the same card, the Broadcom adapter is enabled and has full access to memory. And again, I haven't gone, I have, yeah. No POC yet, but don't worry, I only have a couple slides left, so I'll, I'll GTFO soon. Um, can we do it without imitating a device? Some PCIe switches have this uh, transparent mode that they can go in. So um, some PCIe switches also have this thing called TLP injection, transaction level packet injection. Basically, you can have uh, an actual device, then this switch, and then the rest of your system, and make it look like you don't have a switch there. And at the same time, you can also modify things that go through that switch. And at the same time, you can also um, inject packets to do extra read and write stuff. So it'd be a nice way to, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we could take a genuine device and build it on or maybe build another cool cable that has like this PCI Express man in the middle? That'd be cool. But again, I don't have a POC here either. Um, and some other cool enhancements. Uh, greater than 64-bit DMA would be great, but that's not something that this chip is ever gonna do. Um, and I don't, I don't get the feeling that they're in any rush to update this chip for my needs, unfortunately. Um, and full control over the TLP header would let us do things like spoofing the requester ID and testing all those cool reserved bits. I mentioned Joanna Rakowska. She basically found there were some reserved bits. And when she set those reserved bits, they were actually passed through to the IO APIC, which is what manages all your interrupts on your system and that would allow her as a hardware, you know, a, a PCI Express device to access a bunch of interrupts that should only be accessed by the core of the CPU. Um, so enough unproven concept, time for me to just do GFO. So.